Hi there! Have you ever caught yourself asking who did this while working in Revit project? And if yes, you're not alone. While there is a specific tool to find who modified specific element in PyRevit, it's not much help when you want to select everything one user has touched. And in this video, I want to show you how to find, sort, and select elements last modified by a specific user. And it's not that complicated. First of all, let's go to Revit and we're gonna create a new add-in by using PyRevit. If you are new to PyRevit, here's how it works. It takes you about two minutes to create this kind of extension and it's very, very easy to get started and create your add-ins. I'm not gonna go here because I already have a video about this, which you can watch if you're interested. But in this video, I already prepared button right here. So I'm gonna hold Alt and click on this button and it's gonna open a folder where this code is located. It's right here on the second screen, right here. And I'm gonna open the script.py file and in there I just have my regular kind of template. Just some information about the button, like the name, hover description, which I haven't written, then a few regular imports, variables, and we're gonna write our code right here. And here's what we're gonna do. First of all, we need to get all elements in the project, then we need to find out who touched them last, then we're gonna sort it in the dictionary, then we're gonna ask user to select uh, which user you want to select, and then we're gonna set selection to all these elements. In a nutshell, it's not that complicated, but let's just go one step at a time. Starting with getting the elements. All right, to get the elements, we're gonna use filtered element collector class. It takes just one argument, which is gonna be doc, which refers to the active project, and we already have it right here. Then we need to add a few filters. In my case, first of all, I wanna use where element is not element type uh, method, and this will filter all instances because in Revit API, instance and types are two different elements. And I wanna apply where element is uh, view independent. This will help us get elements which are actually kind of 3D elements. Not like view specific elements, like dimensions, text, some kind of tags, because they can only exist in the view. I wanna get all 3D objects. And this will help me get this. And I'm gonna convert it to a list of elements. That should be fine. And we can just quickly print elements and see what we get. I'm just gonna click on this button. I don't even need to restart Revit or anything. Just gonna click it, and it's supposed to print a list of all the elements in my project. You can see it takes a little bit longer than I expected because probably I should not have printed like a list with thousands and thousands and thousands of elements. But we can see it works, and that's great. Now let's close that, and we're gonna come back to the code. So the first step is done. I'm gonna write here, get uh, 3D elements in the project. Let's actually add here an emoji. I add my emojis by holding the Windows key and clicking on the dot. Then it's gonna open this menu and you can select. Now, this was the first step. Let's go to the second step. And now we wanna find out who actually did this, right? So who did this? Now, let's just write here for element in elements. And we need to find out who touched this element. And here's how it works. We will actually use the work sharing utils class. And then there is a method called get work sharing tooltip info. I know it sounds a bit complicated, but in general, it's going to get this menu where we can find uh, who is the creator, who is the owner, and who has last touched it. That's it. Here's how we're going to do this. We're going to write here that we're going to get this uh, work sharing tooltip info, VTI equals. Then we're gonna take work sharing utils. And then there is a method called get work sharing tooltip info, this one. Inside of there, we need to specify doc, which is which project you wanna inspect, and then the element ID. That's it. Now we're gonna get this kind of work sharing tooltip info. Now I can look inside of it, because it's a class in Revit API documentation and it has different properties, such as uh, who is the owner who was the last changed by, and also the creator. So we're going to take this VTI, and here it's going to be owner, here is going to be last changed by, and the last one is going to be creator. Now let's just print owner changed by and creator in one line for all the elements. But before that, while we're still in this development stage, I don't want to print like thousands and tens of thousands of print statements. So instead, I'm going to write here elements equals list of elements, and we're going to shorten it by using this, uh, what is it called, list splitting, I think. We're going to take the first, I don't know, 30 elements. 
So this will make sure that this element is a Python list, and then I can use this one. I want to take the first 30 elements. Now, I think everything is fine right here. Also notice that nothing is highlighted because I haven't selected my virtual environment, which I'm going to do here. And now it's okay. So let's go click on it and we should get a few print statements. You can see the first one is going to be learn Revit API, which refers to my account. And that's going to be Paul F. Obin, which refers to the sample project from Autodesk for 2025, which is also fine. All right, so far it works. We can find the owner who changed it and who created it. That's fine. Now we can decide which one you want. I don't really care about the owner and creator. I just want to find who changed it last. So I'm just going to use the last statement. Now let me arrange it something like this. And the next step, we actually want to sort it by the user. So now we can iterate through elements and we can find who did it. But now we also want to create a container where we're going to kind of sort it by the user. For that, we're going to actually use the default dictionary because you could use the regular dictionary but then you always need to check if the item is already inside, and if not, you need to create it. Default dictionary, we're just gonna say that we always wanna kinda, all the items, if they are not existent, they're gonna start with an empty list. This way we just write append, and just gonna be added right away. So here I'm gonna write create default dictionary. Actually, I need to do it before that. So let's put it maybe somewhere here. And we're gonna call it dictionary elements by user. We need to import it from collections, import default dictionary, and we're going to create it in default value is going to be list. As you know, when you create dictionaries, you need to specify keys inside of it, right? You have to write dictionary of element by user, new item equals, for example, empty list. And then later you would be able to use it and write here append new item, right? And this new item is actually going to go inside of this list. However, if we're never going to define this list and we're going to try to do that, we're going to crash because it's going to say that this key does not exist. In case of default dictionary, when you're going to do that and it will try to find the item, this one new item, and it's not there, it will create an empty list by default. So we're going to save a few lines of code and it's going to be a bit simpler. Also, this one should be a pent but we don't want to do that right here. Let's just clear it. And we're going to go inside of our iteration who did this. I'm going to write here free sort elements by user. So we're going to take the name of the dictionary and as a key is going to be the name of the uh, person who last changed it. And we're going to append the element itself. We could append element ID, but I think element is quite okay. All right. Now we're going to say for key value in our dictionary elements by user items, we're going to make a print statement. User this has uh, modified this many elements. And we're going to write here in format. So the user is going to be our key because this is what we write right here. This is going to be the name of the user. And the values is going to be a list of elements because we use the append and the default value is the list. And the next value is going to be length of the value because value is the list of elements and the length is going to get how many elements are there. Okay, we can go and test it. Just make sure you don't have the previous print statement. And we're going to try it. So I'm going to click on that one. You can see user poll has modified 30 elements. That's okay. Now we can disable maybe that line right here. So we're not working with the first 30 elements, but with all of them. And just to be sure, I'm going to create here at least one wall. I don't know if I modified any elements yet. So I'm going to click on here and have a look. There is like user without a name has modified one element. This is probably me. Then there is Jade somehow, somebody. Paul F one account, Paul F another account, Josep Agdito and so on. So now I can see that different users has modified different number of different elements. Now I want to select all the elements they have modified and see what they did. Also, I'm not sure why my username is not shown here. So maybe I'm going to select that one. Let's go to Parravit in the team who did that. I'm going to check who selected this element. 
I can see creator is learn Raid API, current owner is learn Raid API, but last change by is nobody, which is a little strange, but I think I need to maybe synchronize it. I'm just gonna save the project because I made it collaborative, but I did not actually save it. All right, now I saved the project. Let's click on it again. Okay, this time it works. I just needed to synchronize it. But now I can see that learn Raid API has modified one element. Woohoo. Now we getting all the elements, we sort them by the user. Now we need to make a simple step right here. So it's gonna be step number four, uh, select user. For that, we're gonna use PyRabbit forms and it's actually very, very easy to use them. I'm just gonna go to, let me just find it, right here in the documentation, there's gonna be PyRabbit effective inputs. This is gonna open this website, effective inputs in the PyRabbit developers documentation. You can also search for PyRabbit dev docs notion, you will get to this page and then look for effective inputs. Now, in here, you'll notice we have a bunch of different code snippets on the left and examples of how this form would look on the right. So we literally copy the code, put it in our code, and it's gonna work and it's gonna create a UI form. Now, if I'm gonna scroll through, I'm interested in something like select from the list. Maybe I select it on the top. Right here, select from list. I'm gonna click on that one. That's what I am interested in. So I'm just gonna copy one of these examples and I'm gonna go straight to my code. So I'm gonna paste it here. So for PyRabbit import forms, then items, we already have a kind of dictionary of items. So we could write here the name of our dictionary and we could take just the keys. It's also not that necessary. We just can provide it directly. So we're gonna take that one and put it right here. Tuck results is gonna be selected user and then selected element is gonna be dictionary and we're gonna use the selected user, selected user. Just one more thing, we need to ensure that user actually have selected something. So we're gonna write, if not selected user, then we're gonna just create an alert. Uh, no user was selected, please try again. And we're gonna use exit script that true. That's a very simple form. That's normally what we use when we wanna stop execution and give a little pop-up saying, uh, no user was selected, please try again, right? Uh, let's just write here, selected this many elements by this user. And we're gonna write length of selected uh, elements. And it's gonna be by selected user. Now we go to Revit as usual, but first maybe, hmm, actually I'm gonna leave this print statement. I kinda like to have general overview. We're just gonna save some space. And let's also make here a little separator. So we can definitely see this print statement separated from that print statement. Now I'm gonna click on it. Now select the user. Let's say I wanna select learn Revit API. Select it. I can see selected one element by learn Revit API. Now, if I'm gonna click again, select some other user, let's say Paul F. Obin, and he has modified 15,000 elements. All right, now let's come back. Now we are kind of getting these elements in Revit API, but now we need to modify Revit UI selection. So let's comment all of it out. Maybe I don't want it anymore. And we're going to the final step, number five, and it's gonna be modify user selection. And it's not that complicated. We're gonna have to take UI doc, which represents the Revit UI of your active document. We're getting it right here by using this line. So we have that one, then we need to get selection. And in selection, there's a method called set element IDs. It takes a list of selected element IDs. So there are two things we need to do. First of all, we need to write selected element IDs equals, and we're gonna kind of change this list from elements to element IDs. I'm gonna write, I wanna get element IDs for element in selected elements. Now I'm gonna try to provide it. That's not gonna work, but I just wanna show you so you're not afraid of getting any errors. I'm gonna click on that one. Let's say I wanna select all elements that I did. And I get that one, and that's a very common one, and that's okay. You see, in Revit API, we often have to use the specific i collection or i list. And then there's gonna be a type of elements. 
because in .NET Framework, there is this typed list. You create a list and you say that inside this list, there only can be element IDs. So there is like a bouncer who checks all the types of elements that go inside. If it's not element ID, you're going to get a warning. In Python list, we can add anything. It can be a number, it can be a string, it can be other classes, whatever. So now we need to take our Python list and convert it into this one. And it's also not that complicated. Let's come back to the code. I'm going to scroll up. You would need to make this print statement. This is going to bring the I list from .NET framework. We need to import CLR, which allows you to connect to libraries like system, for example. So in here, you're going to CLR add reference to system. And this will allow you to make from system collections generic import list. And this is the kind of typed list. So it's going to be list, and then we specify our type. Here's how it works. We're going to come here. I like to write in the beginning list, so I know it's .NET list. Selected element IDs. And when you already have a Python list, it's very simple. We say it's going to be a list. Then we need to specify what kind of types can go inside. It's going to be element ID. And in parentheses, we can either create it as an empty list and then add elements one by one, or we can just provide a whole list as an argument. And then it's going to be converted. And now let's just set it like this. And now let's recap a little. We're getting all 3D elements in our project. Then we're creating default dictionary. And actually we can do it in the beginning. Maybe something like create a container. Yeah, that will do. I'm going to call it create default dictionary container. Then we're going to get all 3D elements in the project. We're going to find who did it. Then we're going to sort it inside of this container we created. Then we're going to ask user which user you want to select, and we're going to modify user selection. Now, the final step is to actually test it. I'm also going to add here a print statement. The job is done. Congrats. And let's see what we get. Now, I'm going to click on the button. I'm going to get this list, and let's say I'm going to select myself. Select inputs. I get a print statement, but more importantly, you can see that all elements are selected. Now, let's actually remove this print statement. It's going to be a bit disturbing. I didn't think of that. But now, here's how it works. I click on that one. Let's say I want to see what Paul has did. Select all elements. It's going to be quite a lot of elements, but we're going to isolate them. And now we have all elements that Paul has worked on. And these are all the elements that if, for example, if I would select this bench, go to PyRivit, then here is who did that who created selected element, you will see that last changed by, by Paul F. Obin. Now let's unhide everything, click on it again, and let's say we select the Jade. Now we're going to isolate that, and we can see that Jade has been working on a lot of curtain panels, also on different railings everywhere, maybe even staircases. No, just railings. And this way you can easily kind of isolate elements made by specific user can be useful when you just gave a task to some new person in the office, they did the work, and you just want to isolate and see what they did. For example, I'm going to click here, and I can see that this person worked on a bunch of different walls. That's totally fine. But also, there is a little remark. Just keep in mind that in Revit, when you're going to kind of uh, make a backup of your model, and you're going to overwrite your central file, which is really, really good for cleaning up cache and so on. If you're interested, just ask me in the comments more about this. But in general, when you're going to do that, you're going to overwrite all the elements and you're going to be the owner of the entire model. So every single element in your model is going to say that you made the element, you last touched it and so on. So if you're doing this kind of advanced backup option, which kind of clears up the model really well, it might not be that ideal, but still it might be good, for example, you make this backup as an admin, then it's kind of starting from scratch, and then everybody works on something. And then you can easier kind of isolate what each person in your team has done, and you can inspect and fix if anything is necessary. All right, guys, and I hope you're going to find this tool useful. And please don't punish all the people who do mistakes. We all do that, but it's really good to find who did something wrong and just tell them to fix it. This way they learn, and hopefully they don't do the same mistake again. Now, if you're new to Revit API, I strongly recommend you to grab my ebook, Beginner's Guide to Revit API. It's free, it's gonna help you a lot. There's like a roadmap, a lot of code examples, explanations, and it's generally what I wished I had when I started. And if you're new on the channel, I think we're gonna see each other soon, and I wanna wish you happy coding.
Goodbye.